to all the lovers of the strange. The sky watchers of the night. Hello, citizens, and welcome to Unknown. I'm Jason McClellan. Thanks for hanging out with me. On June 8th, Washington Post congressional correspondent Jacqueline Alemany interviewed Luis Elizondo, the individual who administered the Pentagon's now defunct UFO project, known as the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. During the interview, Elizondo made a comment about China bringing the UFO issue to the United Nations. They've just announced they've established a new UAP task force similar to ours and they're using artificial intelligence to do this. We also know that there's a play by them to to try to to lead this conversation at the United Nations. Uh, There have been plenty of people opining recently that the topic of UFOs should be addressed at the UN. Most people don't realize, however, that it already has been back in 1978. This special UFO UN event and an associated press conference included astronaut Gordon Cooper and famed UFO researchers Jacques Vallée and J. Allen Hynek. And the individual who produced this UFO presentation at the United Nations is our guest today, my dear friend, Mr. Lee Spiegel. Lee, it feels like it's been forever since you and I got together like this. So I've really been looking forward to today. How are you, my friend? I'm good, Jason. It was. It has been forever. The last time we we saw each other, we were in Las Vegas, and you and a mutual friend of ours, Alejandro Rojas, the the three of us um, were probably walking through that incredible car exhibition uh, in one of the hotels. You remember that? I remember that. And I've got I've got some pictures to prove it. And then you and I. And I think I'm correct about this. You and I had a buffet dinner in one of the hotels that night. And I found out later, and I think it was the same time, that while you and I were eating, apparently there was a UFO sighting above Las Vegas, and we didn't know it at the time. I forgot about that, yeah. But do you remember that now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was in the news later, and I don't even know what it eventually turned out to be. But, uh, but I mean, how could they decide to appear over a major city like that and not let us know in advance so we could interview someone about it? Well, I mean, maybe they, they assumed that we weren't going to be wasting our time at a buffet, but, I mean, we were in Vegas, so. <laughs> well, mean. yeah, but how could we not go I to know, a right? I mean, uh, really. Definitely good times. And it, it has been forever. I mean, that was years ago at this point. That's it crazy. Was. But, uh, you know, yeah. I always love jumping on on shows with you and, and, and doing these interview chats because it's just, you know, it's good to catch up. It's been been a long time. And, you know, there certainly is no shortage of UFO buzz these days. And one of the Boy. UFO related topics that caught my attention a few days ago was this claim that China wants to bring the topic of UFOs to the United Nations. And regardless yeah. of whether that's true or not, of course it made me think of you because you, good sir, already beat him to the punch. You're the only person in history to produce a major presentation on UFOs at the United Nations. So for people who might not be aware of this incredible moment in UFO history, or for those who haven't heard you discuss this before, I would love for you to walk us through the UN UFO presentation, what that was and how it came together. It, it was no small task. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, the, the very first thing that I ever did in the UFO field was in 1975. Just a few days uh, ago, yeah. Uh, just a few days ago. I kind of almost remember it well. Uh, I produced and wrote a, uh, a spoken word, the first of its kind, UFO documentary re recording. Do we remember vinyl records? It's interesting that you bring that up because we are recording this on Saturday the 12th, June 12th, and it happens right. to be Record Store Day. So I love that you're bringing oh. up this vinyl record on Record Store Day. So sorry, continue. 
Is it? You mean it's Record Store Day where you are, or is it like all over the world? It's Record. It's store all day. over the world. It's a it's a day right. that was was sort of created, I think, back in two thousand seven to essentially celebrate records, independent record stores, and a lot of bands wow. now do special releases of vinyl records on this day, and oh. so it's very interesting. But I knew that we had to talk about this today, being that it's Record Store Day when we're recording this. Well, sure. Uh, you know, this was nineteen seventy five, and I. Well, I don't mind telling you this. That what what I was what I was doing at the time, uh, I was working in one of the biggest music store chains in the country called Sam Ash Music yeah. in New York City, and I was uh, I was a salesperson there. It was great to work there because I came to New York from New Hampshire in 1970 uh, with a suitcase and guitar. I was a folk singer, and I was trying to make it I, if, I knew that if i wanted to have a recording to get a record deal somewhere i had to leave new hampshire and come to new york and so in early 1973 i was working at sam ash and and all of a sudden within one it's like a 10 day period in 1973 in october UFO stories, two major stories hit the news media, and it caught my attention. Uh, one story involved two fishermen in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Uh, Charlie Hickson and Calvin Parker were fishing, and they claimed, and it hit the news for some reason, uh, that, that they had been abducted onto some kind of a craft and then later returned to the scene of the abduction. And and about a week later, I think that it was their uh, case that happened first. But then over Mansfield, Ohio, an Army helicopter com under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Larry Coyne, he was Captain Coyne at the time, four-man helicopter crew were flying over Ohio, and they had a near collision with a cigar-shaped UFO, and there were witnesses on the ground to it. I mean, it was a real event. And this thing, uh, actually, they, they didn't collide with it, but when they thought they were going to be hit by it, uh, it didn't hit. It just stopped, and it hovered above their helicopter, and it shined a, uh, a light of green into their cockpit, and, and then it pulled the helicopter up several thousand feet before it let them go and moved off. And when they landed... They made sure the media was there. They wanted to tell the story, and the Army allowed them to. And so I heard about these two stories, and I went, wait, what is going on here? Just just how important is my music career <laughs> at this point <laughs> in my life? And and I decided that I, I needed to, to check into this. It was like that light bulb appeared over my head and said, you're going to stop trying to get a music recording contract. Now you're going to start looking into UFOs. And that's what I did. And I spent a couple of years reading everything I could about it. And then finally, in 1975, uh, I, um, I, I and a few other people in the New York area, we were able to get uh, time to sit with people at CBS Records in New York. And we did a pitch to, uh, for a, what I wanted to do was a recording uh, because I, I had read about and heard about people uh, in the military, in the government, law enforcement, private citizens, scientists who had UFO encounters. And I thought, boy, it would be great to hear from these people. And so we did the pitch. CBS bought the idea because at the time, uh, CBS Records, a, a division of CBS called Columbia House Records, the, in primetime television, they had these commercials, the, the early infomercials, where they were offering to the public vinyl records, the, the great Mitch Miller and the gang, or the, 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 the greatest hits of Montavani and the stringed orchestra, and, and they were selling albums during prime time. And I thought, now there's, there's a place where if I could get a deal about doing a UFO documentary, and if they agreed to, to let me produce and write a, a 60 to 90 second TV commercial, because that had never been done, uh, that would be really worth all my energy at that point. Yeah. And, and it just turned out like that. Everything happened. I started traveling around the country. The first person that I ever interviewed in my life about anything uh, was Stanton T. Friedman, nuclear physicist, who 
the, the late Stan Friedman, and uh, he was living in California at the time. It was great to talk to him about UFOs, and then he turned me on to other people, and, and I eventually went from him to Evanston, Illinois, where I sat down with and became longtime friends with Dr. J. Allen Hynek. Uh, who was the official scientific consultant to the Air Force Project Blue Book that lasted between the late 40s into 1969. Hynek was the man that the, the government and the military always sent around the country to try and explain away UFO sightings. Um, when, I, when I was a kid and there was something on, on TV about UFOs, it was always black and white, press conferences, the, the military would bring up this, this man with a beard, a goatee, and a pipe, and he would sit there and he would have to explain away UFOs, and I thought, wow, if anyone had ever said to me back then, in another few years, when you get a little older, you and he are going to become really good friends. Not a chance. <laughs> Not a chance. So, we did the album, I did the album, came out in early 1976. And then not long after that, some things started happening in media that I was, I was paying attention to. Uh, and that was in, in Grenada, the little Caribbean country of Grenada, their prime minister, Eric Gary, was going on a personal UFO crusade, trying to get other countries to pay attention to him. And, and he was hoping to get the UN to to create a committee of some sort, an investigation committee to share UFO information with other countries. Had he Probably been knighted was, at this point? No, no, he, he, he wasn't knighted. Um, he was just Prime Minister Eric Gary. And I, I watched, watched him on the news and I thought, well, this is good. I mean, here's a guy who's trying to do something. And, um, but I also noticed that in general, the media and other countries just weren't really paying attention to him. And I thought, well, aha, I mean, from what I can see, he's the only game in town. The, in town being New York City, where the United Nations is, no other country at the time seemed to be wanting to be really open and transparent about UFOs. And I thought, boy, if I could just get to the United Nations somehow. And I found, and I, I was told by many people at the time, D -d -d -you, you're crazy. You can't just walk up to the front door of the UN, knock on the door and say, hello, may I please come in and talk to someone about doing a presentation here about UFOs? And, and I knew that I would either get quietly escorted out or not so quietly arrested <laughs> and, and told never to come back again. Right. And others said to me, if you want to do something at the United Nations, you need to be either a member or a citizen of a country that is already interested in this subject, or you need to get friendly with a country where they can make you a delegate of their country in order to do something there. And I thought, well, okay, Eric Gary was the only guy in town, like I said. Uh, and so my, my UFO album, UFOs, The Credibility Factor, was the name of it. Uh, we had already had this thing done and out for about a year or so, and it was doing very well. And I decided to get friendly with Grenada. And what I did was to call the mission, the Grenada mission. Every country has a mission in New York near near the United Nations, their, their own offices. I called the Grenada Mission, got friendly with uh, their ambassadors, and said, I, I have an idea of uh, something that, that perhaps your prime minister would be interested in. It's about UFOs. Um, I have, I have a, a product that I've recently created for CBS about UFOs. And they said, well, we'd love to meet you. So I went to, the, to their office with a copy of my album, and said, please give this to your prime minister with my compliments and let him know that I think that I could help in his personal crusade about bringing United Nations, or bringing UFOs to the United Nations. A couple of weeks later, I got a call from the ambassadors and they said, uh, our prime minister is getting ready to be knighted to become Sir Eric Gary. There's going to be a big ceremony here at the United Nations. We would like to invite you to the ceremony. And then that when the ceremony is over, he would like to meet with you and talk to you about your, your proposal. And I said, yeah, I can, I can be there. 
And then that's, that's how it turned out. I saw it was my first time being actually inside the UN to a, a pageantry of mm. presentation uh, with people from many different countries. Uh, and well, of course, the, the international buffet cuisine, ah, that, that's probably the first buffet that I had that was almost as good as the one you and I had <laughs> in Las Vegas. <laughs> Imagine, um, but we it was there, and and when the, the the various participants there all sort of went their own separate ways, I was I was brought into a room. The prime minister was brought into the room, and they left us alone with them, alone with each other. Nobody stayed around to make sure I I wasn't there to do him any harm. And he he said that he really enjoyed listening to my album. He really especially liked all the people who I had gathered for the album. Mm -hmm. And he said, what's, what's your idea? And I said, well, you know, I said, well, Mr. Prime Minister, and congratulations on now being knighted, by the way. Uh, I've been following you on the news and, and I noticed that the United Nations in general and the media is not really paying much attention to you. In fact, the media is, is they tend to ridicule things like this here in 1978. And, and I said, if you like what you heard on my album, I could bring some of these people from the album to help support your cause if you would sponsor my pr proposal. And we talked about it for a few minutes, and we ended up doing a handshake deal right there in that room. He said, I would really love to sponsor you, and, you know, wel welcome aboard. And when can you start? And I said, well, I'm already starting. I'm here with you. And what happened almost immediately after that, Jason, is the, uh, the country of Grenada gave me uh, my own little delegates card. It was about the size of a little credit card, and it was it had the United Nations logo on it. It's a country of Grenada, with my name, Lee Spiegel, delegate to Grenada, um, which meant yes, now I could actually legitimately do something yeah. at the UN, and it was probably because of that delegates card that I guess word got back to our State Department, and they st at that point they knew that I an American citizen was now doing something for Grenada. Mm -hmm. and, but, I, but I didn't realize any of that until much, much later. And I'll get to that at the end of the UN story. Uh, so not only did I get the delegates card, I started receiving checks from the, I guess the United Bank, National Bank of Grenada. <laughs> and this, this was to, to, to pay offset my personal expenses that I was going to need out-of-pocket expenses. I was going to do some traveling around the country, gathering documents and talking to people, and just whatever expenses that I would need so that it, it would legitimize what I was doing without being a salaried employee, you know, of Grenada. And, and so uh, then for the rest of that year, all I did was to work on this presentation. Alan Hynek and I met many times and while I spent one of my uh, trips to his home and office uh, in Illinois, we were in his office going through, we were, we were putting a packet together that we intended to present not only to all the countries at the UN, but to all members of the media who would show up on the day of the presentation, which was scheduled for near the end of November in 1978. So we, were, we had gathered a lot of different kind of documents about UFOs. And and I said to him, Alan, this is really good stuff, but you know, I'm looking for something that that I would consider a smoking gun about UFOs. I said, you were with the Air Force during Project Blue Book uh, for more than 20 years. I've got to believe you, you got your fingers into some places that maybe you shouldn't have gone to, but you had you had the clearance working with the Air Force, and, and do you have anything that, that, that you could actually give me that we can use and present to the UN? So he walked over to a filing cabinet, and he pulled out a manila envelope, and he, as he handed it to me, he said, I, I don't know if, if you would consider this uh, a smoking gun, but if you want, 
you can you can use it at the UN. I'll I'll give you my permission. And and I I opened it up, and what I was looking at was this lengthy chapter from 1968. It was from a a textbook, a science textbook textbook that was. It was edited by two Air Force officers, and this chapter was the chapter thirty three was called Unidentified Flying Objects. The book itself was called Introductory Space Science. It was part of the physics department at the at the Cadet Academy, the Air Force Academy. And uh, it was for Air Force cadets eyes only. And it was meant to bring them up to date in nineteen sixty eight on what the current state of interest was an information uh, that the Air Force believed or th thought about UFOs. And, and I'm reading, and I'm reading all this stuff, and and it, it, it had international historical references, other important data. And, and as I kept reading through it, I looked at Alan, I said, I let my language go, I said, what the, where the, did you get this? Yeah. You know, uh, and he said, "Well, you don't have to know that, but <laughs> if, if you like it, I mean, he didn't say anything like, well, if I told you, I'd have to kill you.' There yeah. was nothing like that." Um, he said, "You can make some copies of that and give it out at the UN." Well, I mean, I ended up making about a gazillion copies. Of, Good for you. Uh, and if if you'd like. I can I can give you a couple of quotes right now of what was actually in that chapter. Yeah, it's pretty I, incredible. Yeah, I I think your listeners would like to hear yes, maybe please. a couple of things. I, I've got it up here on my screen. Let me. Uh, basically, they start out by saying, "What we will do here again." This is the Air Force telling their cadets right. in 1968. What we will do here is to present evidence that UFOs are a global phenomenon which may have persisted for many thousands of years. Um, bang, bang, bang. UFOs sightings not only appear to extend back 47,000 years through time, but also are global. One has the feeling that the phenomenon deserves some sort of valid scientific investigation. Uh, the most stimulating theory for us is that the UFOs are material objects which are either manned or remote controlled by beings who are alien to this planet. And there is some evidence supporting this viewpoint. They go on. Why no contact? That question is very easy to answer in several ways. Number one, we may be the object of intensive sociological and psychological study. In such studies, you usually avoid disturbing the test subject's environment. Number two, you do not contact a colony of ants. And humans may seem that way to any aliens. A variation, a zoo is fun to visit, but you don't contact the lizards. And number three, such contact may have already taken place secretly. Again, 1968. From available information, the UFO phenomenon appears to have been global for almost 50,000 years. The majority of known witnesses have been reliable people who have seen easily explained natural phenomena. This leaves us with the unpleasant possibility of alien visitors to our planet, or at least of alien-controlled UFOs. However, the data are not well correlated, but, but the questionable data there are suggests, and I love this, the existence of at least three and maybe four different groups of aliens, possibly at different stages of development. I didn't make any of this up, Jason. This is what the Air Force was telling their, their cadets. cadets. I have to, I'll have to pound that in. It says, so uh, different stages of development. This too is difficult to accept. It implies the, exi the existence of intelligent life on a majority of the planet's in our solar system, or a surprisingly strong interest in Earth by members of other solar systems. A solution to the UFO problem may be obtained by the long and diligent effort of a large group of well-financed and competent scientists. Unfortunately, there is no evidence suggesting that such an effort is going to be made. So, you know, I was so enamored with this thing that Dr. Heineck gave me, and and we we gave it out at the UN. 
the packet was put in front of every every nation's chair there at the UN. It was given to every member of the press that showed up. And I, I have to tell you, I thought everybody was going to jump on this, on this one right. piece of evidence. But they didn't. Nobody did. I, I couldn't believe it. And, and I was so pissed that nobody picked up on it, especially in the media, to even do a follow-up story about it. Again, this was 1978. We hadn't even had a fully created thing called the Internet at, at that point where you could just, you know, post things and put them up for all the world to see. No, I mean, this eventually appeared on the Internet later on, but, but I was giving it to them. I was handing it to them on a platter. Here's the other interesting thing about this. The book, the introductory space science book with this chapter uh, was in 1968. Shortly after that, uh, the Air Force r revised that chapter and they put a new chapter in and they had taken some of the things out of the original chapter, okay? And then follow a little, a little further on ahead of them, less than a year later, the Air Force closed Project Blue Book. Coincidence? I'm not sure. And when they, and when they closed Project Blue Book, they basically said, folks, there's nothing of any scientific interest to us here after we studied more than 12,000 reports. Nothing going on here of any scientific value. Uh, there's certainly no threat to our national security, and we have no evidence that any of these objects uh, are extraterrestrial. Like, wow. And now we know, all these years later, mostly because in 2017, when when the Pentagon, the New York Times, released that big game changer story uh, about the Pentagon revealing that you know, we've been studying UFOs for a while now, and suddenly the Navy is chasing them. Now we've got we've got UFOs videos with the Tic Tac UFOs, and because of that, now everybody has to su suddenly realize, wait a minute, but they told us in 1968 that there was nothing to it. Does that mean they were telling us the truth in 1968? No, they they weren't. And haven't all this time. So, we but we did the presentation. Alan Hynek and Jacques Vallée, um, Stan Friedman, and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Larry Coyne from the helicopter incident were all there as part of my speakers to to talk about what they wanted to say to the UN. Uh, when it was all over, the Secretary General's office let all the other nations of the world know that if you're interested in, in working with Grenada to form some kind of an international committee where everybody can do research together or you can at least uh, do research in your own countries and share it with other countries to kind of get to the bottom of this. So while they were waiting for enough countries to, you know, to kind of chime in on this, just a couple of it must have been, I think, only a couple of months after we did the presentation, uh, there was a, uh, a political coup in Grenada, and Sir Eric Gary vanished. Yeah. He vanished. And, and, but it didn't, it didn't mean that the UFO resolution could never happen again. It just quietly went to sleep, and it's still there for anyone who'd like to try it again. A couple of years went by, and I'm sitting at home watching the ABC News with Peter Jennings, and he announces that uh, under the leadership of uh, President Ronald Reagan, uh, we have sent American troops into, and we have just invaded Grenada. And I watched this on the news, and I thought, I I'm never leaving my apartment. This is my yeah. fault. It's got to be <laughs> my fault. And, and then the, around the same time, the kicker of this is I started to lead into this before. Do you remember, do you know the name Peter Gersten by any chance? I do. Yeah. Peter Gersten was at the time in the late seventies, he was an attorney and he was like the lead attorney for cause citizens against UFO secrecy. Right. And he called and what he did primarily for cause was use the freedom of information act to get government documents about UFOs. And he called me one day and he said, hey, I just got a, a batch of new documents. And one of them talks about you and what you did at the UN. But it was written 
before you did the project, I mean, it was just like a month or two, or two before the, the the presentation happened, mm-hmm. and and it, it names you as the ringleader of this whole thing. <laughs> uh, would you like me to send you the document? I said, no, 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 no. Uh, don't do that. Uh, I'm coming up to your office. I had to get on a subway, go up to the Bronx, right across the street from Yankee Stadium where his law office was, and I rushed into his office and I said, just hand it to me. I, you know, if anything's going to happen to it, it's going to happen to it while it's in my hands. Yeah. <laughs> because I wanted to see this. And and it was amazing. It was uh, correspondence, as I learned later, one of many pieces of correspondence uh, talking about what we were trying to do at the UN. Listed all the names of my speakers, and at one point in, in the document it said, we understand the person responsible for bringing all these people together is producer Lee Spiegel. How would you like us to handle this? And the correspondence was between the American ambassador at the UN and the State Department in Washington. Like, wow. ah. and, and I read this, you know, a couple of months after our presentation, I, th- I thought, how did I survive? How did I come out of this alive? Right. Why didn't they try and take me down? <laughs> I mean, wow. The the only thing that I knew that that I was being watched at the time during 78 was there was a period of time when I knew that my, my, my telephone line was, was being bugged. Hmm. Uh, I, I could always tell uh, if I went to pick it up and make a call, I could I could hear this. It'd be like no dial tone. I could hear some actual breathing and some wow. clicks, and I would hang it up. And then I would I, after a while, I thought, no, this is this is ridiculous. I so I picked up the phone again. I heard some clicks and I heard some breathing, and I said into the phone, "Listen, uh, I know you guys are there. I know you're listening to me." I'm not making the kind of call now that would really interest you, so you might as well turn your tape recorders <laughs> off. I'm just making a personal call. You can come back later if you want, but I'm only going to be on for about like five minutes. So yeah. So you know, and then I hung up. Just just <laughs> Good let for them you. know what a what a year that was. Yeah, I bet doing doing the UN. Um, there was so so much stuff behind the scenes things. I, I learned along the way that Sir Eric Gary was not the nicest guy in the world. I learned that uh, people had said to me, "If if the Prime Minister uh, invites you to come down and spend a weekend at Grenada, you should politely decline mm, wow. because he they they said they, tell, they said to me he has a a goon squad of sorts down there who. Yeah who make people vanish um, if they don't agree with the, the prime minister's points of view. So better to stay in the United States. Yeah. I thought, well, okay, what have I got myself into? But you know what? Never, never would have done it differently, Jason. It was, it was just amazing to be there, to meet all these people, to be part of something that, that Dr. Jacques Vallée to this day says what we did there was a milestone. Right. And 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 to your point, to your question about learning that China is interested in now doing something at the UN. Um, I first heard about this a couple of years ago when I was working as one of the uh, the producers of the uh, the documentary, the phenomenon right. that was put together by by the great James Fox. Mm-hmm. And James took at least two trips, I believe to China because there was a big UFO-related celebration going on on, on, in mainland China, and he videotaped a lot of things, and he interviewed people. Um, China is very, very interested in in UFOs, and they're serious. There's no ridicule there about that. They're a lot more transparent about it than than we are. Mm -hmm. And so to, to learn that China may want to bring us up to the United Nations, I think that's a great idea. And I have actually had some conversations with Jacques Vallée, and I've suggested to him that if, if we can pull our energies together, I said, I said to him, Jacques, of all the people that I had there at the UN in 1978 uh, to give speeches and to give their points of view about UFOs, you're the only one who's still around. It's a sad reality, yeah. And, and, and I think that 
for your legacy in this field, w would you like to give it another shot with me? You know, and get some other people because now the climate has changed so much, so radically. I think the ridicule factor is now almost almost diminished entirely, and we now know that there are many countries that are out there uh, that are really interested. They're being very open. They're working together. South American countries, uh, the military factions of different countries, are working together, right. uh, trying to figure this thing out. Uh, and I, I said to Jacques, if, if you're up for it, uh, let's let's talk more about it, because let's get more than one country to do something about this, not not just one. But again, right. in 1978, it was just Grenada. I had no other choice back then. But right, you are this, right. The the climate has completely changed, so it would be a completely different ball game right now. Um, yeah. Let's let's talk about the the, the reception and and you know sort of the. You know some of the, uh, the the feeling from other countries back when you did the presentation. Um, you know, were were other countries receptive? Did yes. other countries I'll, object or try to stop you? <laughs> How did that happen? Well, I'll, I'll get to the stopping part afterwards. Okay. Um, but um, yes, I had a chance to meet several heads of states, leaders of countries mm -hmm. uh, from around the world, and. And in these meetings, they said, we, we don't know what these objects are that are flying in our skies as well as American skies. They seem to be almost everywhere. Yeah. Um, and so we, we would be interested uh, if there was a majority of countries that would want to create a sharing committee of UFOs, unidentified flying objects. And so I felt, I felt very... Uh, positive that something actually might have come from it. The only thing that, that got in its way was all of a sudden when Sir Eric Gary was was wiped out, right. which which was like, whoa, okay. I mean, who saw that coming? I didn't. Maybe maybe people in the State Department and other places saw that sure. coming. I'm always asking people, who's really in charge here of, of all this kind of information? Um, and so I, I was very hopeful about it. But then it's just it just went away quietly, hmm. and and then fast forward thirty years, when I was working as a writer for the uh, the Huffington Post, and I was writing mostly UFO and paranormal stories, and every once in a while, uh, the the United Kingdom was releasing previously classified UFO materials to the public. And every time that they had new batches of reports to uh, to release, they they generally gave them to insiders first. And the only person I knew inside at the time uh, was Nick Pope, mm -hmm. who used to work for the Ministry of Defense uh, in the in what was called the UFO office or a desk uh, back then in the 1990s. And and so he released he got the releases first, and and so I knew he had them. But then I didn't really need to contact him initially because I could just get them now as they were being released to the media. Yep. So I'm I'm reading some of, through some of these reports, these documents, and, and I'm suddenly seeing something that I'm not really crazy about. And I went to my my editor Buck Wolf, and I said, "Listen, this." I, I think I need to change my attitude about this story, about these documents, because it, it, I, I think I need to take this more personally. Some of these documents are, are indicating that in 1978, the United Kingdom really tried their best to stop my presentation. And that was, <laughs> like, here I am. That was 30 years ago, yeah. and I'm only learning this now? By reading these documents, I said to I said to Buck, "Listen, uh, I'd like to write the story in the first person, and because I was there, basically." And Buck said, "Yeah, go with it, run with it, do it." One of the first pe people I called at that point was Nick Pope, <laughs> and and when he when he heard that it was me on the phone, he uh, he said, "So, hello, Lee. Um, I I know why you're calling." And, and I said, well, you probably do. It might have something to do with some documents that have just been released by the United Kingdom. He says, yeah, yeah, I got, I got those, those documents as well. And, and I, I have to tell you, Lee, um, you, you can't 
blame me for any of that stuff that the United Kingdom was doing in 1978. I had nothing to do with it. Lee, I was 13 years old yeah. at the time. And so I didn't even have working papers yet. I, I wasn't a member of the Ministry of Defense. I had nothing to do with this. And I said, well, Nick, I'm not blaming you at all, but, but I am going to let my writers know that, that I've been in touch with you. He said, would it help if I if I kind of issue like a, an, an unofficial apology um, for what we did or what we tried to do for your presentation? Yeah. I said, yeah, go ahead, go for it, give me it. He yes, said, all please. right, well, I, I unofficially apologize for what my country <laughs> did when I was only 13 years old. And, and I think I published it just like that in my HuffPost story. But wow, to realize that, so back then, England didn't like to have the the public information known about about UFOs. They just wanted to let it go and keep it uh, under the carpet, so to speak. Yeah, uh, like, yeah and it's funny with, with with Nick during that period while while these uh, MOD files were being released, it seems like part of his PR role in that. There, there seemed to be multiple instances where apologies or half apologies were being made. Because I, I remember also he was talking about how the, the wording in some of those files revealed how they were taking an active stance at ridiculing people and making, yes. you, you know, that the language they would use, talking about UFO buffs and things to, to downplay yeah. the UFO issue. He told me during one of my interviews with him that when he was working at, at the UFO desk, back in between 1991 and 93, I think it was, he said he used to go to like um, UFO uh, symposia, yeah. you know, or, or conferences, mm -hmm. and he would just kind of look around and, and, and he would end up going back to, to the office and he would write about them and put reports together. And he said, we, we engaged in something called spin and dirty tricks. Right. I said, really? The hell was that? He said that that meant that we had we had an, an an attitude of ridicule that we wanted to keep this stuff away from the public's awareness. We didn't want to cause any panic. <clears throat> we didn't want people to criticize the government. We wanted people to just go about their daily lives uh, and let us handle it. Spin and dirty tricks. Like whoa! If it's not one thing, Jason, it's another. I mean, really, right? Uh, it, it's just it's just amazing, and. Uh, and, and so now, and now we've got this thing coming up. Uh, um, when when uh, are you airing this show? By the way, it should should air uh, a couple of days from now, or maybe maybe even tomorrow. We'll see. Okay. Well, by the time your listeners hear this show, we we may already have seen the the long awaited congressional new report on UFOs or UAPs. <laughs> That, that's you know the, the latest uh, terminology, unidentified aerial phenomena. Big difference between that and unidentified flying objects. Uh, yeah. But but as many people now know, I I, I talk about it a lot on my show. Yeah. Um, the uh, the the intelligence agencies uh, and the FBI and the Pentagon have been working now to create an actual congressional report that they're going to give to Congress and supposedly then to release it on or about June 25th. Yeah. And so we're, everybody's been waiting for that to see what's, what's going to happen, what's going to be in that report. And about a week ago, the New York Times, uh, they wrote a couple of stories in which they had already con been contacted or they contacted some actual government officials who had already seen the report and who were giving their opinion of what the report will probably contain. And they were saying that this UFO report is basically going to say um, and, and admit and confirm, yes, there are strange objects in the sky that are, that are flying above America, and, and they, they, they have a technology that we don't have. It's not American technology. They outperform us. They outmaneuver us. Um, our Navy pilots have, have interacted with them, and we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that it's extraterrestrial, but when it's, it's not, you know, out of the question. But so with that in mind, we are 
Uh, we're still looking into the possibility that it could be a Russian technology or, or Chinese technology. And this is where they're going to go with the report. And, and this annoys me to no end because whenever I hear something like that, I come right back like I did on my show this week. And, and I, I say to, to my listeners, okay, so if it's America saying it's not American, it might be Russian and Chinese, or the Chinese are saying, well, it's not us in China, it could be American, it could be Russia. My, my comeback to that is, okay, who had this technology in 1947? Mm -hmm. Are yes. you hearing me, everybody? Yes. 1947. And, and that's not even where the UFOs sightings even began right. historically. But, I, but I'm just going to 1947 when the Air Material Command Lieutenant General Nathan Twining wrote a very famous memo that went all through military factions, basically saying the uh, the subject of the memo was the flying discs, because that was before the, the term flying saucer mm -hmm. had even come out. Uh, and according to Lieutenant General Nathan Twining, he began his memo with the phrase, the phenomenon, and that's where we got the name for our movie <laughs> from a few years ago. Right. He said, the phenomenon is something real. It's not fictitious. It's not illusion. It's not delusional. Um, objects approximating the size and shape of a disc with a dome on top. Uh, the, with incredible maneuverability potentials, especially in, in how they can evade uh, friendly aircraft when we approach them and try to make contact. They can come and go as they please, and we don't know anything about them. And we, we highly recommend an internal investigation of these flying disks. And so that was about the time when various things happened, and we ended up having something called Project Blue Book that supposedly was tasked with looking into this. But 1947, again, did anybody have this technology? No. The things that, they, that he was reporting in his memo in 1947 were exactly the same things that the, the Navy pilots reported off the San Diego coast, um, the maneuvers that these objects made, what they look like, and everything that they reported in 1947, they're still reporting now. Right. And you would think Who that, that right? you know, yes, with their argument that, you know, this could be China or Russia, some some country that's leapfrogged the U U.S. in technology, you would think if that was in 1947, we surely would have seen that from another country by this point, and we certainly have not. But on the other hand, it seems like the extraterrestrials, if they are extraterrestrials, haven't really advanced their technology if they were doing the same thing back in 47 that they're doing now. So that's interesting, too. Well, and you know, you know what I like about what you just said? Uh, because 1947, that famous year, when when something came streaking out of the sky outside of Roswell, New Mexico, and, and crash-landed, we, we now know from many sources, many credible sources, that there have been other crashes here and in other countries. And so right. my, my attitude about that is, well, well, okay, if they do, if it is visited from somewhere else, and they have this incredible technology that we don't have, what's wrong with their, with their ships that they keep <laughs> crashing? <laughs> I mean, look, it's like, are these, are some of their ships, are they would be considered the Edsel of, of extraterrestrial. The Edsel, I love that. <laughs> uh, I mean, really, so, we don't have this technology. We nobody had this technology in 1947. But what's wrong with the technology anyway? What's wrong with right? That? <laughs> uh, Maybe that's what makes it so difficult to back engineer too. I, I know. And, or maybe and, we tried know, and realized it sucks. <laughs> I, I and I, I don't understand that attitude. If if in fact America, the American military or American scientists have been working behind the scenes, if they've got one or more of these ships at Area 51 or wherever, and they're trying, and, and they've been trying to figure out how do they work, and, and let's, as you say, reverse engineer it so we can make our own. My, my, my attitude about that is, if it's a technology, 
that we don't have, what makes us think we're smart enough to figure out how to put it together? Right. How can we think we know how to do that? Sure. I, I don't think we are. Yeah. Not I'm yet anyway. There. Not right. not not until not until the a few more hundred years pass and we're in the the time zone of of the enterprise and warp warp speed and yeah <laughs> all the things that we really need. But no, we 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 don't have this kind of stuff yet. Yeah. And 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 I'm I'm comfortable with that. When when people ask me, I, I get asked the same kind of questions. First, they ask, "So when uh, when is it going to be real disclosure about UFOs?" Mm-hmm. And I, I just come right back and say to people. There has been ongoing mm-hmm. disclosure for sure. decades, but sure. you've got to know where to look for it. You can't – I say to people, please don't get all of your accurate information from just watching episodes of Ancient Aliens. Mm-hmm. Please. please. You've got to know where to go and what to read. And most people don't. That Most people don't want to disrupt their daily lives. And I, and I get that. I'm okay with that. I understand right. that. Uh, we all have our lives to lead, yeah. and and so I don't think there's going to be disclosure, and 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 people then will say to me, why why don't they just if we're being visited why don't they just show up, land on the White House lawn or land in the Kremlin, and and my response to that is, well we don't know what their reasons are for being here, we don't know what their agenda is, uh, UFOs UAPs from from the from the first time they were reported, they come and go as they want. They they do what they want. They appear and disappear from wherever they go. Yeah. And if they didn't want to be seen, why do they turn their lights on after dark? Yeah. I mean, really, mm-hmm. they, they want to be seen. Uh, and so we don't know why they do what they do. We're, we're not smart enough to really know what's going on with them. I'm comfortable with that too. Uh, I I don't care where they come from. I'm totally satisfied that that we're being visited, and that's just based on almost 50 years of my looking into this. Hmm. So I'm not saying to people, "Oh, you got to look. You have to spend 50 years to to either believe or not believe." Uh, just just a couple of nights ago, on the on the, the HBO show Real Time with Bill Maher. Uh, he had on as a guest Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, mm-hmm. astrophysicist, and uh, I think he's out promoting a new book. And in that book, he has a chapter about UFOs. And Bill Maher said to him, "Yeah, we want to talk about various things, but but uh, you know, UFOs are in the news a lot lately. And I want to know what you think about UFOs and are we being visited?" And I was waiting for the answer. And 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 deGrasse Tyson as I guess believes when he says this, or maybe this is what he's been told to say, he was ridiculing. He was saying, you know, these Navy pilots, and, and they've been claiming to see this thing, or something called the Tic Tac, and, and they, all this maneuverability. And yeah, you know, even Navy pilots are not t- totally reliable. Uh, they, they could be delusional. Uh, even uh, airline, commercial airline pilots. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? You're, you're downplaying this? And, right. and 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 I I said, listen, if I if I had a chance to ask him, maybe I'll take a chance and try and get him on my show because, but I don't want to get into a debate into a debate with anybody because I sure. don't think I have to. I don't think that I have to be on the side where I have to try and prove the case. I think that the debunkers have to prove it on their end. Um, I mean, really. I, I would say I would ask someone of Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, have you personally looked into, spent any time in your professional astrophysicist life looking into this science, this topic? Right. Have you spoken to other scientists of equal caliber uh, and qualifications as you? Have you spoken to any of the military pilots? Have you spoken to someone at the Pentagon? Uh, the people who are in the know, have you really taken the time to do that? And I, I, I think I know what his answer would be. No, I don't yeah, have to. Absolutely. I, I, I don't absolutely. have to. It's, it's it's more logical to think that we're not being visited. They couldn't possibly get here. Um, they couldn't cross the great distances of space if that's where they're coming from. And, and again, it's like 
how long have we been flying in our airplanes since the Wright brothers? Just barely 150 years or, or not even that much. If you have any idea of, of most scientists now, astronomers will tell you that the numbers, the sheer numbers dictate that we're not alone because of how many galaxies there are, how many suns there are, and how many planets there are orbiting those suns everywhere in the universe. There's a lot. And, and so for any other technology to develop somewhere else, if they're only, gosh, if they're only 500, 1,000 years ahead of us, that means they can do something that we don't know how to do yet. And I'm comfortable with that. It doesn't make them better than we are. It just makes them <clears throat> a little bit better at doing certain things than we are. There's nothing wrong with that. It's nothing to be afraid of. People shouldn't panic about that. But to just out and out ridicule the idea that we're being visited without actually investigating it, that's... Uh, it's that's irresponsible and it's unscientific. Completely, yeah. Yeah, it, it's like, I don't know how much longer this is going to go on because I, I don't think we're any, we're near close to any kind of a, of a public announcement because it can't come from the President of the United States. Mm -hmm. It can't come from the Prime Minister of England. It can only come from a, a unilateral, multiple country announcement that all countries agree on. That's how that kind of an announcement can come. The UFOs, <clears throat> the intelligence behind the UFOs, they don't care. They don't care what we think, how we, how we think about them, because they don't have to care. Nothing's going to stop them. Nothing has stopped them except, except their own technology. <laughs> sure, sure. No, good point. Um, on the topic of global uh, collaboration, cooperation, let's jump back to the UN quickly. And first, I mean, obviously, I have to mention that you have balls, my friend, because you Why? went in pr producing this UN event without having done that before, without knowing how to do it, without having the internet to help you research how to go yeah. about doing that. You know, you yeah. made this happen decades ago, and that is is truly amazing. And I'm still in awe of that. You know, so many years later. Um, well, so so kudos on that. Um, but also, I'm curious to hear what knowing today's climate. And, and going back to the idea of revisiting a UFO presentation at the UN, doing something new now, in your mind, how do you see that that playing out? What what would a modern day UFO presentation at the UN look like? I think it would involve uh, it, would, it would obviously involve in order to 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 make it more palatable to everybody, uh, there would have to be m more time. I mean, the presentation that we did was just under two hours, uh, and and I think it should be a little longer. It could be something that could last uh, a few days, like over a weekend, and there should be representatives of more than one country that that are willing to come out and talk about yeah. what the, what's going on in uh, above this guy. And um, there should be more people. There are much more people now, different people, that are very open about the UFO subject and just some names that come to mind. Well, certainly Jacques Vallée, because I'd, lo I'd love to get him back if possible. Clearly, clearly. But, um, I mean, Christopher Mellon from the intelligence uh, world. Um, Lou Elizondo, who, who used to work uh, at, at the Pentagon involved in, in charge with the behind the scenes uh, investigations of UFOs. There are people in, in different countries who I think would be willing to talk, would feel more comfortable talking if they could do it in numbers. I think so too. You know, again, in 1978, Sir Eric Gary didn't have the international respect, I don't think, that more people in different countries now have. I wouldn't even... Certainly I wouldn't. not somebody to lead the charge and somebody who other countries would feel comfortable following. Yeah, and, and you know what? If I had, If I had to choose... I wouldn't even approach the U UK right now. Not after what they did. <laughs> so that's understandable. Uh, I mean, really, I, I I think that there's probably there are so many more documents that can be 
given, evaluated, and even forget the documents. Come on, folks. We've only really seen three confirmed videos. Let's let's go with more videos. I mean, <clears throat> look, a couple of years ago, when James Fox and I were working on the phenomenon, and, and we spent a good part of an afternoon in the law office in Las Vegas of Senator Harry Reid, uh, the former, you know, ma the majority leader of the Senate. And he he's the one who you know, really helped to get all the money to, to create this Pentagon UFO study. Right. And, and, and he, he said to us, there's so much out there. The, 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 the three videos that have already come out, that's nothing compared to what we have. It's there. We have it. And, and and shouldn't shouldn't scientists of many different countries have the right to look at these things? But no, nobody's doing that. And everybody wants to be the ones who, who you know get the power first. Let's re-engineer. Let's reverse engineer this so we will actually have our the first flying saucer. Well, it ain't gonna happen. Yeah, it, it, it's not going to happen. Uh, t just talking to to people like. Harry Reid was was amazing to to hear the things that he told us. He told us things that ended up on the cutting room floor that never made it into the phenomenon. Uh, that you know was really really interesting. I mean, we we weren't even really going to mention to him or ask him to talk about something else, which I had wanted to, and, and James said no. Let's let's just kind of leave it. But during during the conversation, and James was asking. Harry Reid, all, all the, the, the right stuff. Reid just suddenly said, you know, there's a place in Utah. Uh, it's a ranch. And it, it's a place. And he, and he never made, he didn't mention it, that the name is Skinwalker Ranch. He said, but there's a, there's a ranch there on which almost every paranormal phenomena that you can think of has occurred. And there have been teams of scientists the first team of scientists was led by Robert Bigelow, <laughs> uh, who's, who's under contract with NASA to build new space modules, and, and he, he created this, this whole um, organization of scientists, and one of the first scientists there was Jacques Vallée, the first, the first person who, who spent the night there at Skinwalker Ranch, uh, who was with... Um, with Bigelow when he bought the ranch from the owners who had to leave because they couldn't stand it anymore, uh, was former Army retired Colonel John Alexander, and and he 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 was he wanted to, to not only did he see the the uh, the changing of the guard from the ownership of the ranch from one person to Robert Bigelow, but but he insisted John insisted on spending the night there alone. He's the kind of guy where, in the 1960s, he was an A-team commander. Yeah. I mean, it's like, if you want to be anywhere in a jungle during a war, he's the kind of guy you want to be with. Yep. You know, he could get you through anything. And he, he spent the night at Skinwalker, and there were things that that freaked him out a little bit, too. And and he and I have talked about it, and I've, I had him on, on the, my show, again, yeah. about talking about these things, and he... Um, he's a no-nonsense man, right. and he wrote an amazing couple of books about UFOs. Absolutely, everybody by surprise, uh, and and he's the kind of guy that says, if there's something paranormal going on at Skinwalker Ranch or somewhere else, <clears throat> we need to study it instead of make fun of it. That that, that attitude shift has to change. In order to, to, to make the public realize that we're not alone. We, we could be getting visited by someone uh, who, who's just on the other side of an invisible you know, plane of existence right. you know, or, or dimension. There's, there's so much out there that we don't know. And Absolutely. I, 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 would, I hope, but I don't think it's going to happen, uh, that we'll know about these things in my lifetime. Uh, I, I just I don't feel that positive about, about how transparent this information is going to be and when it can come out. Yeah, that's a, a realistic view. And, uh, you know, certainly one that from somebody who's been in this field for so long and looking into the, the strange subjects like this. Um, yeah, it, I, I share that, that view 
as well. Uh, we're, we're past an hour here, Lee, so we should probably wrap up our conversation for today. But okay. you mentioned your show a couple of times. Please do tell us the name of your show and how people can show. listen to your fantastic okay. show. The name of my show is Edge of Reality Radio. It's a resurrected version of the first talk show that I did um, almost 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, on NBC Radio. Called radio? What's that? Yeah, I know. What's radio, right? <laughs> uh, I did The Edge of Reality uh, for NBC. And then when I was uh, approached uh, a few years ago by KGRA, uh, Digital Broadcast Network, to, to come on and do a new show, uh, I said, okay, but I'd like to call it uh, Edge of Reality again because I may still have some people out there who used to listen to that show. I want to keep the, the listeners out there. And... <clears throat> Uh, I instantly did a, um, I went online to do a, a domain name search for Edge of Reality, and somebody took it. It was some rock and roll band from from the South calling themselves Edge of Reality, and I went, It's a good band name. Damn, I, I, I guess. <laughs> uh, and and it, was my, it was my lovely wife and muse, Lorraine, who said to me, you know, uh, why don't you go go back online and do another search and look for the words edge of reality radio dot com and I did and I found it and I bought it. Way to go, Lorraine. All right. It, it just kind of rolls off the lips, Edge of Reality Radio. And and so that's that's the the name of the show. I'm on KGRA D B. If anybody's interested in hearing the show, it's on every Thursday evening uh from eight to 10 p.m. Eastern Time, so you can go ahead and figure out when you can hear it. Um, as I said, K, just you can just Google KGRADB.com, and it'll take you right to the KGRA page, and you can uh, look at the archives and just see all kinds of things about the show. So I'm glad to be doing it again. Yeah, that's exciting. Well, I sure do miss getting into trouble with you, Lee, whether it's been in Phoenix or New York or Las Vegas. You and I have had some great fun over the years conducting our covert ops together. I really miss that. So I can't wait till you and I find ourselves in the same place again so we can uh, get into some more trouble. Well, I think you'll be the kind of guy that I'd like to do that with. I, I mean, because you've got, you've got the look. <laughs> you've got you've always look. had the look that I I always thought that the the visitors would probably really be attracted to you much more than me. <laughs> well, I don't know if you would have as much luck with me as you did with uh, Robin Leach. You know, Robin Leach is a, is probably a better buddy to go UFO hunting with, and you did that. So I, I did the late great lifestyle of the rich and famous man Robin Leach. Yeah, we yeah. Were, we were friends for over forty years. Right, and, and I miss him. A lot. Absolutely. Well, you and I can certainly do it. Um, I don't know if, if I have the look they're looking for, but we can certainly uh, use me as bait. I'm, I'm game. Oh, oh, yeah. I use you as bait at the end of a long, strong fishing pole, right? <laughs> yep. All right, Lee. Thank you so much, buddy. I appreciate you taking the time to hang out today. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for having me on. We, we can do it again. Well, citizens, that's going to do it for this episode. Isn't Lee awesome? I love that guy. If you want to learn more about Lee and his incredible career in the strange world of unexplained phenomena, check out his website at leespiegel.com. You can find more episodes of Unknown on all the major podcast platforms, and you can always find this show and our other shows at rogueplanet.tv, because Unknown is a Rogue Planet production. Rogueplanet.tv is your home for all the strange. Thanks again for hanging out today. I'm Jason McClellan. Do us a favor, friends. Always treat the UFO subject with the cautious and responsible skepticism it deserves. Question everything. Have the courage to form your own opinions. Keep truth as the focus of your quest, even if the truth conflicts with your opinions. And, of course, stay strange. Stay strange.